go. All right, um, so today is the uh, second week of our teaching series, The Good Good Teacher. Um, for those of you who came out last Friday to my new house, me and Natalie's new house, um, we, uh, we started to look at Christ as a teacher. You see, Jesus has a lot of hats that he wears. He does a lot of different things, and to us, we see him as our savior. You see, he's much more than that. He teaches, he saves, he gives up his, his life, he, he heals, he exercises demons. And as I was preparing, as I said last week, as I was preparing for all of this, and I was reading through the book of Luke uh, last summer, I realized that the section that we're going through is all about Jesus' teachings. And it started to make me think about Many conversations I've had with you, or many conversations I've overheard you have with your friends about your teachers. Oh, my teacher hates me. Oh, my teacher sucks. <laughs> teacher doesn't teach. All these other complaints that you have about these teachers, these valuable teachers. But you see, Christ is not that. And as we read through these, these next couple of sections, you'll notice that everything he teaches is perfect. It's spot on. You cannot defeat his logic. Last week, we were introduced to prayer. And Christ spent a lot of time really teaching us about prayer, how to pray, what to pray about. And he gave us an example, the Lord's Prayer. How many of you guys know the Lord's Prayer by heart? Most of you guys should. Okay. And if you don't, that's okay. That is completely okay. The point of the Lord's Prayer, while it is an important prayer, we should pray daily. It is simply a model for how you should be praying. Now, today, today we're going to kind of turn things down a little bit. We're going to kind of dial down the energy a little bit and get a little bit serious. Uh, because what Jesus is about to talk about is something that is very important to all of us right now. And what is so amazing about today's sermon is that when I first thought of this whole format, it was back last December when I was talking to Pastor Steve about it. Back when we had no idea what this year was going to hold. We could not tell what tomorrow was going to bring. So we had no idea that God had everything already lined up so perfectly that it works out to fit exactly what we're experiencing. Today we're going to be reading Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. But the message is only going to focus on the first half of that section. I'm going to explain here in a second. But it says this, chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Were those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and have not found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. And indignant, because Jesus is healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give, water, give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for eighteen long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? 
When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Will you pray with me? God, I ask that you be with us tonight. As we talk about a very serious subject, I ask that you soften our hearts, take away our distractions, focus our minds on you. Lord, a lot has happened over the past four to five weeks. It has affected thousands and millions of people all over North America. Lord, I just ask that you be with all those people, those who are suffering, those who are hurting. I ask that you be with us and give us the strength to pray for everyone, to find the courage to stand up for what is right. In the name I pray. Amen. So ladies, the second half of this, this section that I just read is very important to you. Because this is one of many times that Jesus demonstrates how important you are to ministry, how important you are to the world. Gentlemen, that section is important for you to understand how valuable ladies are to us. How important they are to provide us a new insight to the way the world works. And we must treat each other with respect. So I encourage you, later on, after you through, sometime this week, get with a group of people. Read that section again and talk about it. Because it's all about gender equality. Focusing on female equality. But the section I want to focus on is the first nine verses. These verses focus on loss, tragedy, and sin. You see, in ancient Israel, they believed, and, and even for the most part today, that when you sin, you are causing an issue for yourself because God is going to come and judge you. That judgment comes way of sickness, poor health, loss of finances, family member dying, you dying. This is why these, these Israelites are coming to Jesus about this. Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. You see, in their mindset, they had this idea that these Galileans had sinned, so they deserved what they got. But that's not what Jesus is, has been preaching and will be continuing to preach. And this is why he confronts them and says, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? So let me, let me get you straight. Let me, let me see if I can understand you the right way. Because that select group of Galileans who Pilate murdered, took their blood, mixed it with your sacrifices, they're worse sinners than you, even though you're a sinner. So because they're worse sinners than you, they suffered that way. No. Your sin, no matter how small you may think it is, is equal to God with those sins. So now, I'm not telling you that sin is the cause of their death. I'm not telling you that God is coming down with wrathful judgment to put these Galileans to death because of their sin. If that's the case, you should be dead too. This is what he's telling these, these Israelites. This is what he's telling his countrymen. He's trying to help them understand that what happens in the world around us is not by God's doing. All these evil things that happen that they're experiencing is not because of God. Let's go back to the Galileans. He's trying to refocus their attention back on who caused it. Pilate. Through God's infinite wisdom, when he created us, he wanted to impart himself on us. So he gave us free will because God has free will. So Jesus' logic is that Pilate, in being a creation of God, having the image of God, has that free will to choose to do what he wants. He made that choice. He made the choice to put those Galileans to death. That was not God's act. That was not judgment. But it was the bad choice, the bad decision of one man you see, he doesn't stop there. He doesn't help to clarify that God is not the cause of evil. 
He goes even further and says, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Unless you give up your sinful ways, you too will suffer the same fate. Maybe not necessarily killed by Pilate. Maybe you're walking from Jerusalem to Damascus, and a lion comes up and eats you. Maybe a robber stabs you or cuts your throat. Maybe you fall sick. Maybe, maybe your crops die, and you lose all of your money. So that's not what he's wanting the Jews to hear. He's wanting to them, for them to understand that whatever happens to them is by their actions. It is by the choice of others. If a robber comes and hurts you while you're walking home from the market, it's not God. That person chose to do that. But the focus is on repentance. The focus is on turning away from our sin, stepping away from our bad choices, so that when that time comes and you are called home, that you can stand before God, the ultimate judge, and be free of all that you've done. I said this is a serious conversation because this applies to now. As many try to figure out why Stephen Paddock shot up all those people on Sunday, some will blame God. They're looking for someone to blame because it doesn't make sense. This man is 65 years old, a multimillionaire, has no problem with the law. Why did he all of a sudden gun down an entire concert? Well, here's one theory. It's the government. The government's trying to hurt you. They want to be able to push their agenda, so they go in and hurt a whole bunch of people to justify the laws they're trying to push through through Senate. No, that doesn't really work. Guy's not affiliated with the government. Pays his taxes and just a normal person. Okay, well, well, I don't have any other reason, so it must be God. He must be the one doing it, because I can't explain why this stuff is happening. It's simple. Sin. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. You see, Pilate did the same exact thing that Stephen Paddock did. But he went even a step further. Not only did he slaughter thousands, but then he took their blood and put it in the most precious time they have. Their sacrifice, their offerings to God. To really stick it to them and say, Ha, I rule you. I own you. I control you. It wasn't because of God. It was sin. Sin had poisoned Pilate's mind. Sin had poisoned Stephen Paddock's mind. The result of what has happened is, is not because of some supernatural force. It is a choice by one man who decided to go and end the life of others. Here's the hard part for us. Here's a real difficult part about this, especially being teenagers. You are not invisible. Any one of you very well could die tonight. God forbid. You could get in your car and get in a car accident and never be alive. So Christ is urging us right now. Repent of your sins. Give up your bad life. Give up the choices that you're making now so you can make the right ones. So that if your time is to go home right now, you can stand assured before God that you live the life that He wants you to live. But you see, there's something special about us that, that they didn't get to experience. That cross. Well, we need to repent. We need to make that conscious decision to turn away from our bad choices. There was a man a long time ago who gave up his life for us so that we can be free so that we can look at the parable that he shares a man owns a fig tree in his vineyard a man is God the fig tree is you the gardener is Jesus what does Jesus do he stands in defense of you he comes to your defense before God he says, no, no, God, please, I beg of you, stop for a second. Let me share with you 
who they are. Let me tell you their lives. And I promise you, they will bear fruit. I promise you, God, they will be the people you want them to be. Because I'm the one who's teaching them. Because I am a good, good teacher. He also talks about natural disasters. With the tower falling, there was no reason for it to fall. No evil person came in, blew it up, and caused problems. It just fell. It wore out over time, and the winds, and the sands, and erosion just tore down the tower. It wasn't by any act of God. It just happened. You see, something that we, we don't understand about the world around us is that God created all the laws that govern the world that we live in. All of these hurricanes, they are not a punishment. They're not God coming in and saying, Puerto Rico, you are evil people, you are going to die. Houston, because you don't believe in me, I'm going to flood you. What, is, what does the Old Testament say about that? He put a rainbow in the sky to promise us that he would never do that again. And he holds true to his promises. We flood because we choose in our own free will to live in an area we know is dangerous. That has the propensity of being flooded. That is our choice. It's not God punishing us. Because we choose to live in luxury that we fail to build up proper fundamental structures that protect us from the floodwaters. Because we'd much rather have gigantic skyscrapers than build a waterway that helps to funnel the floodwaters out and away from us. That is our choices. But God doesn't cause a hurricane to happen because he created all the world and we live within that world. He wants us safe. He wants us happy. He wants to take care of us and provide for us and nourish for us. And the truth is, you go back to Genesis... None of this would ever happen. We would not experience floods. We would not experience death. We would not experience psychopaths gunning down a concert. If one person hadn't made a mistake, if Eve had not chosen to eat the fruit, we would not be here today. We would be safe in the garden, protected by God himself. He would be standing here in physical form with us, guarding us against sin. So as you wrestle with this, as you look at the world around you, know that God is here always. That Jesus is defending us. Even when we constantly make bad choices. Even when we come to youth group every Wednesday and we proclaim being a Christian, yet we still live in sin. He still goes to the cross every day for us. It's absolutely beautiful. As we come to the table tonight, this is why this exists. This supper is a promise. It's a promise that the gardener will always come to our aid. He will pull those weeds out. He will dig around the roots and put fertilizer down so that we can grow healthy. So we can bear good fruit and share our faith, share the glory of this meal with our friends and family. So we can testify to the truth that there was a man 2,000 years ago by the name of Jesus who died on the cross for us to save us from God's judgment. So that we go before God when our time is, has come, whatever that may be, today, tomorrow, when you're 90 years old, you are washed clean of your sins. Yeah. He's sitting down at the table after all of this has happened and and he looks at his disciples and he takes the bread. The, the last loaf, all right, that was sitting next to him. The, the plate that was waiting for Elijah and he breaks the bread. And he looks at his disciples and he's like, guys, everything I just taught you, you know how I taught you about the fig tree? Remember that story I taught you? Remember how the, the Jews came to me and said, what about those Galileans who Pilate killed? This, this is why you are not going to experience death. Because I'm going to break my body for you. I'm going to experience your sin. I'm going to take your sin on my back so that you don't have to. 
Take this and eat, and every time you do, remember what I did. After he passed it around, he took a cup, Elijah's cup. He gave thanks to it, and he said, listen, you take showers, you take baths, you clean yourself, but that's only a physical cleaning. That's nothing. This, this cleans you. This is my blood. I am sharing this of my free will for you. So that you can be washed clean of your sins. So that you know that God doesn't cause harm in the world. <coughs> that God loves you so much that even while you're a sinner, I'm going to die for you. All of this is for you. It is for me. It is for these adults. It is for every Christian who proclaims Christ as the Lord and Savior. And as we come to the table, I want you to remember that, that saving. I want you to remember that man that's on the cross. I want you tonight to repent of your sins. When my time is, is up and I go home, I want to be able to see you. I want to spend all eternity with you. So may tonight, that night that you repent of your sins, that you turn around, you change your life, that you accept this for what it actually is, the body and blood of Christ. Will you pray with me? God, I ask that you be with us tonight. Help us to truly understand that you love us, that you don't seek harm, that you don't want pain to come across us. That you gave us this table, that you gave us this bread and this wine so that we may be free of our sins. Lord, I ask that you give these students the strength to repent tonight. Lord, may tonight a powerful night where there is transformation that is happening in these kids' lives. Help them to understand that they are safe. Doesn't matter if it's a hurricane, it doesn't matter if it's Stephen Paddock, if it's ISIS, it doesn't matter who tries to hurt us, that you are always going to defend us. That you are there to die for us, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen.